What makes a game immersive? Is it the photorealistic graphics, or the cinematic cutscenes, or the polygon count of an onion? Oh, that's hot. That's hot. Immersion in video games is a widely discussed topic in the gaming industry and is often associated with graphical advancements and realism. But I found that some of the most immersive games I've ever played look like this. Oh my goodness! I just finished my first ever playthrough of Fallout 1 a few days ago and was fully invested in the characters, I dove deep into understanding all the factions and their motives, and explored every bit of the wasteland that I could. So even without these onions, I was completely immersed in a game from 1997. So what made Fallout 1 immersive for me? And to ask the broader question again, what makes any game immersive? The answer will almost always depend on your own tastes, but I think there are some elements that objectively make a world feel more alive. And these are the things I find are most important to get me fully invested and immersed in a game's world. Environmental storytelling is a way of delivering the story through the gameplay systems and the world design itself in a non-linear way. It's both visual and auditory storytelling without the need of explicitly telling you what's happening through cutscenes or dialogue. It's the scenery, or the placements of enemies and items, the ambient sounds, or lack thereof, that set the stage and speak for themselves. Bioshock is one of the best examples of how a game's environment alone can be effective at telling a story. If you were to remove the audio diaries, and the characters that speak to you like Atlas or Tenenbaum, the world of Rapture would still convey an engrossing and haunting story through its visuals. New Year's Day 1959. This underwater utopia was turned upside down chaos ensuing amongst every district, from high society clubs and theaters to farmers markets and fishing ports. Each area does a great job at showing the kind of place Rapture was, and then what it became after shit hit the fan. Warnings written out in blood, corpses strung up in grotesque ways, advertisements for different professions that lead to sinister discoveries. Rapture visually represents the potential nightmare of a world with unregulated capitalism and objectivist morality, almost like current year America. In Bioshock Infinite, the environments completely embody the theocratic American exceptionalism, and on the surface makes Columbia appear like this perfect, pure Christian society, until you start digging a little bit deeper and peeking into the cracks of their infrastructure, sort of like Mormons in Utah. This is all done through visuals alone. The narratives and the dialogue of the Bioshock games are great, but it's the environments that really sell the whole thing. The narratives and dialogue can only work if the world itself is already believable and established. In the first Dark Souls, there are so many memorable locations and revelations, like venturing deep into Blighttown and seeing just how far your descent to the swamp below will be, first gracing the beauty of An Orlando, or navigating an idyllic crystal cave on the way to discover what it hides. But I don't think anyone will forget their first time discovering Ash Lake. The haunting music that evokes a remembrance for this home of the ancient dragons, this vast emptiness of a long, strange pathway of sand, the miles of trees still speculated and discussed about today on their true purpose, and to be greeted by an everlasting dragon at the pathway's end. Ash Lake is one of the most fascinating locations in the Souls franchise, and yet we know so little about it but it forever lives in our mind because of the curiosity and wonder that it elicits. The cool thing about environmental storytelling is that it requires a certain level of deductive reasoning from the player. It encourages exploration for the player to actively partake in the storytelling through discovery. We are the ones that must connect the dots, determine the morality of certain characters, understand how we fit into the world. It's a design that respects the player's intelligence, like in Fallout New Vegas and its numerous hints and clues about the backstories of various characters throughout its world. No Bark Noonan might just seem like a crazy old geezer, but do a little bit of digging and there's a good case to be made that No Bark might just be the chosen one from the first Fallout game. If anyone asks, we never spoke. Halo Combat Evolved is a game that you might imagine is a fairly straightforward, by the books, linear FPS campaign, and in many ways, it is but it houses a lot of environmental storytelling through its missions, and there's no better example than in the mission 343 Guilty Spark. You land in a foggy swamp. A crashed Pelican dropship is nearby. Inside, you hear a radio transmission about some new kind of hostile enemy. Venturing deeper, and your radar begins to light up with yellow dots, meaning you're being surrounded by an enemy that your radar doesn't recognize. When pushing further, a bunch of Covenant can be seen fleeing the area. You push forward. 
you come across a few more Covenant, this time holding a defensive line facing into the facility. Further in, you find signs of a bloodbath of both Marines and Covenant, and a yellow substance raining down from above. And eventually, you encounter a Marine shouting. Stay back! Stay back! You're not turning me into one of those things! I'll blow your brains out! Get away from me! So far we've been soaking in a lot of visual storytelling that heavily foreshadows the remainder of the mission. And after finding a helmet cam with footage of some of these marines getting attacked, you eventually find yourself encountering that same threat. The Flood. The storytelling of 343 Guilty Spark isn't completely spelled out for you, but if you pay at least a little bit of attention to your surroundings throughout, you're going to pick up on the foreshadowing and some amazing details. My favorite detail in the aftermath is being able to find the bodies of two marines and two jackals on top of a barrier, surrounded by ammunition, implying that the Covenant and the marines, in this last moment, died fighting together against this new common enemy, holding the line against the Flood. Now this is another great strength of environmental storytelling. You are discovering it while actually playing the game. No need to sit through hours of cutscenes or dialogue, just get straight into the action. And if you pay attention to the environment, you're going to experience the deeper aspects of a story. It's in games like this, or games like Fallout or Dark Souls, where I'm left more to my own devices, that I become more connected to the world and story because it feels like I'm an active participant, rather than just a passive viewer. Now this doesn't mean that dialogue and exposition in games is all bad, though oftentimes it can be. I think of far too many games that have characters constantly spell things out for you, too many menus to read through with too much information, dumped on you in a short amount of time, and I think that does nothing but turn me and many others off from a game completely. It's not an enjoyable or engaging way to experience a story. It's like being in a college lecture versus a more hands-on learning experience. Humans are visual creatures after all. But that being said, some games are heavy on the dialogue and use it to enrich the story. Bioshock does this, and it fits perfectly because it doesn't disrupt the gameplay to show a cutscene. 90% of its story is happening while you're experiencing it. Firewatch is probably the best example of good dialogue that services the environmental storytelling. Most of the dialogue happens over radio between Henry and Delilah, and often they discuss things the player is seeing or witnessing. Henry and Delilah's conversations also feel believable and real because of how well written the conversations are. From fixing a power line, to finding teens drinking at the lake, or discussing a research station deep inside the woods, there's always good back and forth of dialogue in Firewatch. And it's becoming more and more rare to find any media with dialogue that actually feels realistic or isn't a big pile of cringe, so games with genuine adult themes and dialogue is another massive way I can become immersed in a story. I often question why games are even rated M for Mature these days because the dialogue is almost always geared towards the absolute lowest common denominator, with all the intelligence of a cucumber. Love the confidence, but before you pull the ripcord, I'm afraid I need to add a bit of a wrinkle. I think one of the biggest reasons I can't get into Starfield is the writing and the dialogue. That game has so many problems that I'll get into in another video at some point, but one of the biggest is the Gen Z Disney Star Wars cornball dialogue. Their dialogue plays it extremely safe, is super vanilla and predictable, and just downright embarrassing at times. Starfield NPCs don't feel like real characters at any point. They feel like a chat GPT script. They speak like an actual AI. They behave like AI. And yes, NPCs are technically AI, but characters in these games are at least believable characters that happen to be AI. You get the difference? Ubisoft isn't known for amazing dialogue in their games, but I just finished another playthrough of Assassin's Creed 2, my personal favorite AC title, because I'm working on a retrospective of the game before the release of Mirage in October. Subscribe so you don't miss it. And it's incredible to pick out so many good bits of dialogue in the conversations. Ezio's interactions with every single NPC and character always felt believable and charming. The dialogue is huge for immersion for me in that game. Be careful, Ezio. Do you know who that was? My next conquest. <laughs> uh, I don't think so, Ezio. That's Caterina Sforza, daughter of the Duca di Milano. Her husband is... Husband? See, si, her husband is the Lord of Forli. That woman is as powerful and dangerous as she is young and beautiful. Sempre come una donna per me. 
I recently spoke about video game graphics versus art style in a recent video, and I wanted to again touch on art and visual style a bit more to explain how it plays a role in immersing me in a video game. Now, I'm a fan of almost any art style. I may have stronger preferences than others, but these three games have wildly different art styles and visual styles, yet I would consider them some of the most immersive games I've ever played. I think what art style and visuals need to do is be consistent. From software games always feel like you're inside a painting. The side-scrolling Ori games also achieve that same feeling. Borderlands has a look of a comic book, and Hi-Fi Rush is a bit similar with its cel-shaded art style. A game like Battlefield 1 went for a very photorealistic look, and all of these games can be described as immersive to me because they are consistently catering to their visual style. Now I'm gonna rag on Starfield a bit more here because there are times that the game looks pretty good, mostly when looking at landscapes or close-up textures, but the lighting of most areas is always inconsistent, with many indoor areas feeling washed out or too dark, with conflicting light sources, and of course, all the characters are often incredibly ugly and even more uncanny than Cyberpunk. I don't know how Fallout 3 and New Vegas from over 10 years ago can have a more consistent visual style in our direction, with somehow even less ugly lighting and characters than Starfield, but it really is true. Starfield is simultaneously one of the best looking games out right now, and also one of the absolute ugliest. And I think it goes back to a matter of believability. A world doesn't have to necessarily be super realistic to be believable. It just has to adhere to its tone, setting, and atmosphere. Games made in the Source Engine, like Portal and Half-Life, are some of the most immersive gaming experiences I've ever had, and I didn't play those games until just last year. They have a timeless visual style, and you're given a lot of freedom with the gameplay sandbox that makes those games fully engross you in the experience. The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker has a very cartoon and stylized art direction, but I can't help but feel fully immersed when sailing the sea at night, or exploring the various dungeons. Battlefield 1 is a good example of realism done right. It isn't historically accurate to World War 1 all the time, but it feels believable even though a lot of the weapons and means of battle were only conceptual of that time. It is a video game at the end of the day, so making Battlefield 1 be a trench warfare simulator would probably be incredibly boring. So instead, DICE took weapons and areas of the real world and gamified them into something incredibly immersive. Soldiers screaming as they charge into battle, the intense sound design, the overcast lighting of the battlefields, the epic soundtracks, the photorealism where it actually counts, and the attention to detail like mud buildup on your weapons. So many things were done to drop the player right inside a real world war. But one underrated aspect of immersion that doesn't get a lot of attention is in the interactivity of a game's world. If a game has a train, can you hop on and ride it? Can I kill any NPC in the game, even the named and important ones? If I have a map of the world, is it in a menu, or does my character actually pull out a map and read it? Far Cry 2, Firewatch, and Sea of Thieves do maps perfectly. Or using your Pip-Boy in Fallout to access the entirety of your UI is another great example of in-game interactivity. It lessens the layers of video gaminess and makes even the menus feel in-universe. Again, Starfield really struggles here with 60% of the gameplay and exploration all taking place inside menus and loading screens, rather than say a more clever system like what No Man's Sky has implemented. Also, why is there no gore in that game? Isn't the game rated M for Mature? Why Bethesda went out of their way to remove gore from Starfield despite being a staple in every game since Fallout 3? is just beyond me. It makes the game feel much less reactive to your violent actions, when enemies just kind of fall over. But I digress, that's enough about Starfield. So what makes a game immersive? Well, I'm going to try and sum it up in a short paragraph. It's a sense of grandeur, mystery, and player discovery, world building through character dialogue, and environmental storytelling. A lot of show, don't tell. In-game interactivity, and a consistent art and visual direction. This is what immerses players in a game, and so many different types of games can reach that criteria. But let me know what you guys think in the comments section. What immerses you in a video game?